Okay, um, we're going to get started now, please. Um, so, my name is Damon Clifford. Um, I'm based at the ANU, so the Australian National University. Uh, and together with uh, Jeff Austos and Lauren Knotts, we're going to present the topic that you can see fairly illuminated on your screens. Um, it's a nice opportunity for us to, to work together on this because we're three former colleagues. Um, Jeff is now based at Evier at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, Lawrence is at the KU Leuven, where we all uh, did our PhD, or where Lawrence is still, uh, his PhD research is still ongoing. Um, so the format of this really is, uh, we're going to give uh, a brief introduction to the topic itself, like what fairness means, uh, specifically within data protection law. And uh, then we're going to look at a case study um, that we wrote out. We, lead very exciting lives. We spent a lot of time putting together this kind of slightly bizarre hypothetical so we could go through some of the problems practically speaking. Um, and that's when we will we'll be asking you to participate in this. Um, now, it's such a big room, it's going to be a little bit difficult, but we're going to see how we get on. Um, so we would like you to you know, say something at certain points if you have ideas or interventions. Uh, you know, that we have two roaming mics as well, so we can walk around a little bit. Uh, and we will try and divide you into some sort of a group or leave you discuss amongst yourselves uh, the hypothetical case study. Uh, but for now, I'm going to leave Lawrence uh, do a bit of the presentation, and uh, we're going to rotate between us to, so you don't uh, get bored of anyone in particular. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, by the way, there's also the slides of the presentation are up on the micro site. Uh, and in that version, you can also find additional resources on the slide notes. Now, before we delve into how fairness is perceived within the framework of data protection and the GDPR in particular, I'm trying to, uh, in the next few slides, get a bit or give a bit more detail about fairness approaches in general and how fairness might be perceived within uh, machine learning research and within the machine learning community. Now, as a general, some concepts that carry within themselves quite a big history, notions such as justice, fairness, equality, they all seem interrelated, but they are nonetheless distinct. So let's try to get a bit used to these concepts as they might reappear in the presentation. And I think that within the machine learning community, and if we look at what machine learning does, it tries to help us individuals to make sense of data, but also to automate decision-making processes that affect the burdens and opportunities that are afforded to individuals within society. And from that perspective, uh, we can draw a lot of inspiration from political philosophy. And it was also one of the presentations that was given uh, last year by, by um, uh, Ruben Binz on lessons from political philosophy. Now, what political philosophy tries to do is the strand of philosophy that provides the interplay or explores the interplay between several aspects of social life, economic, civil, legal, and see how they can be best accustomed to the interests of citizens within society. And the main subject of in investigation for a political philosopher uh, could be considered the theory of justice. And what you do within a theory of justice, or what justice more generally tries to do, it tries to look at what are the desires of people within society they might oppose to one another. Not everyone's desires can be fully satisfied, but how could they best be structured? How can we distribute the opportunities, burdens, and benefits amongst citizens? And a theory of justice will formulate principles that serve as moral guidance. And one of these principles can be equality. Equality can be thought of, well, like situations should be treated alike, different situations should be treated differently. A theory of justice will try to give more substance to that formal principle, for instance, by saying when it comes to uh, employment, there should be equality of opportunity when it comes to access to employment. And then when it comes to fairness, fairness in general is quite an elusive concept that can have very different and distinct meanings. Uh, and in justice, one, or in theories of distributive justice, one might say, well, it's called into question when we consider those distributions of benefits and burdens amongst people. Um, 
and what these next slides will try to do is kind of give you an idea that there are not one single definition of what is fair or what is just, that there can be different conceptions that can conflict with one another, but also that fairness within justice might be different from fairness within data protection, even though they can relate to one another and they can be used in function of one another. Uh, so when it comes to justice, I think there are many various theories of justice out there in society. Not all of them are egalitarian. Uh, many of them promote equality to a certain degree, but not all of them. And an excellent example of how they can conflict with one another and how it's very difficult to kind of uh, reconcile the different views on justice was given by uh, Amartya Sen and is the idea of justice and he uh, has pictured this parable of three uh, kids who find a flute on the floor. And, well, one kid says, well, I am poor and I have no toys. So actually, from an egalitarian perspective, he's the less privileged, let's give him the flute. Whereas the other girl says, well, I am the only one amongst the three that can actually play music. So from an utilitarian perspective, I should be the one that gets access to the flute, whereas yet another girl says, well, I have been the one who made the flute, this is my work that got into it, I should be the one that which should become the owner of this instrument. And Sen rightfully said, well, if you look at it from in an abstractive perspective, these three individuals have an equal and rightful claim to the instrument, and it's very difficult to kind of prefer one over the other. They all make sense, and how can we deal with this? Now, I am only given this as an example to say, well, there are these different conceptions of what is just or what justice might be, but they might not be reconcilable. So decisions will have to be made. And it's the same with if we consider fairness as a means to, that comes into play when we distribute something among citizens. Well, fairness as well can have many different conceptions and understandings. And it can be said that fairness is broad in application because many different things can be said to be fair. A person can be fair in how he treats one another. An institution can be fair when, when it comes to a government. But as you will see later in this present, presentation, we can also talk about data processing as being fair. So it's the same term that is used for all these different notions. So what does it mean in all these different contexts? It can also be complex in, in structure. Do we consider fairness when it comes to the outcomes that people get access to? Or is it more in the treatment that people are subject to? What should be fair? And maybe it should be in a perfect ideal system, a fair treatment that leads to a fair outcome, and our desires co-align with both on a distributive and a procedural level. And it's also morally deep in content. In obviously, when we want something or when we argue something to be fair, we, it's often underpinned by strong reasons. Um, equality as a concept can also have different meanings. We can talk about moral equality, when individuals should be treated as equals, uh, with equal concern and respect. And this is considered the egalitarian plateau within contemporary social justice theories. Almost every social justice theory accepts the fact that it is built around the premise that people should be treated with equal concern and respect. But when it comes to social equality, or what it is that we should actually equalize amongst individuals, there is a lot of discussion. Equality of what? What is the currency of equality? Is it equality of opportunity? Is it equality of resources? Is it equality of welfare? And this should be also distinct from the ethics of discrimination, which deals with questions of when we differentiate individuals, when we categorize them, what is it actually that makes it problematic? It doesn't necessarily deal with questions of what should be made equal amongst people, but rather, when is it wrong when we treat people differently? And what should we do about wrongful discrimination? Now, fairness in machine learning, um, or at least within uh, certain strands, is mainly considered as fairness as a sense of equality-seeking principle whereby fairness is often considered as trying to achieve an abscess of bias within the learning system. And 
Often, this bias is also considered as we will try to reduce within the system a bias towards sensitive attribute groups, such as we need to reduce bias on the basis of ethnicity or on the basis of, of gender. Of course, recently in literature, there has been more emphasis on awareness regarding new forms of differentiation that machine learning uh, can bring about, but still bias often seems targeted towards these known injustices within society as a fairness as a means to address them, which also tends to be, or a potential danger is, that it might be more design-based and that there's a, a wrongful perception that because we focus on what is known about the wrongness about society, we tend to think that it might be also resolved through design, whereas we also need to take into account the societal aspects or the, or the, the societal interaction that a technology uh, will bring about once it is deployed. Um, so this is a bit of an overview on how you can think of fair machine learning. You might think more from the perspective of is it an outcome that we want to make fair or is it a procedure that we want to make fair? And there you might want to think of as a data protection law, as a procedural mechanism or institution to allow for more fair machine learning approaches. For instance, by allowing more or by granting data subject rights so people can get in access or insight into a machine learning process, by increasing transparency, by increasing control, but as well from a technical perspective, perhaps the formalization of fairness is considered uh, a procedural mechanism to achieve a fair machine learning outcome. And of course, outcome and procedures can relate to one another and often the, the outcome is in function of the procedure and vice versa. Um, now, from an equality perspective, data protection can be considered as an instrument to also have more egalitarian concerns in mind by not focusing on the outcomes of a machine learning process, but rather focusing on the underlying algorithmic decision making. Um, and this relation is also a bit more present on a fundamental level. If you look at the European Court of Human Rights case law, I won't go into the slide, but it will be made available if you want to uh, take a look at it. But in general, before I give the hand to um, my colleague Jeff, is that when it comes to technological uncertainty that, te that machine learning systems might confront us with, uh, we might be best suited with a fluent concept like fairness which, like the technology we seek to assess or address, can be subject to a periodic re-evaluation. And even though fairness in data protection might have a meaning that is distinct from fairness in social justice, the idea that we will now explore that data processing should be fair could be interpreted in function or in light of social justice. All right, so now let's zoom in on uh, how this concept of fairness uh, manifests itself within a data protection law uh, specifically. Um, but before looking at the GDPR uh, in particular, and the framework that everybody in this room, I assume, will have heard of, uh, it's important to take a step back and look at uh, the broader normative embedding of data protection in the EU. As some of you may know, the right to data protection features in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is legally binding within the EU since 2009. And so this has important ramifications because uh, the initial European-wide uh, data protection framework, the directive from 1995, had a, had a much bigger market dimension to it. And so there's a clear trend now uh, to a more fundamental rights perspective. Also, uh, you see this more and more in uh, the, the case law of the Court of Justice uh, in Luxembourg. And so anyway, um, in this Charter of Fundamental Rights, um, the right to data protection is clearly distinguished from the right to privacy, or sh we should say actually the right to respect for private and family life, which already featured in much earlier uh, fundamental or human rights frameworks, and most famously also in Europe at least, in the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, 
and this has uh, already given rise to quite some debates on the exact scope and delineation of these two rights and especially how they relate to one another. Uh, but that is not uh, what um, we're going to talk about uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, you could easily fill a whole conference on, on, on that. Um, very, put very briefly in, in, in our respective research, uh, also in the paper uh, that uh, Damien and I wrote, which is in the reading list, um, we interpret uh, the, the, the right to privacy as, uh, as something that safeguards things like, like personhood and respect for, for personal space and family. And this also underlies very much the debates on gay marriage, on abortion, and, and quite recently also has been used successfully uh, in the Netherlands uh, to force the government uh, to take environmental action. And data protection, on the other hand, the right to data protection, is really focused on safeguarding individual autonomy over our digital selves. And so just like we are guaranteed autonomy and liberty uh, when it comes to our physical bodies, the right to data protection purports to do the same thing uh, with regard to our digital ones, if you will. And as you can see, our, uh, uh, the, the, the fairness concept is, uh, is included in the second paragraph of Article 8, requiring any and all data processing to be done fairly. <clears throat> now, of course, the right to privacy and the right to data protection are far from the only rights in the Charter, uh, the, the, which the, the Charter also includes uh, right to dignity, non-discrimination, uh, religious freedom, economic freedom, and so on. And these rights and freedoms will often enter into conflict with one another. After all, they, all, they each pursue singular goals or values. And so how do we resolve these conflicts? After all, these, these rights and freedoms, at least in theory, are on equal footing. So the Charter tries to do this in Article uh, 52. Uh, and so Article 52, Paragraph 1 in particular, lays down these conditions for limiting uh, the full enjoyment of any of the rights and freedoms in the Charter. And so subject to the principle of proportionality, limitations may be made only if they are necessary and genuinely meet objectives of general interest recognized by the Union um, or the need to protect the rights and freedoms of others. And so the way the Court of Justice, uh, which is sort of the Supreme Court uh, in the EU, has gone about this uh, in the cases before it um, through balancing acts. So a classic example in the data protection context specifically is the, uh, the, the so-called Google Spain case or right to be forgotten case, uh, where a balance was struck between, on the one hand, an individual's uh, rights and freedoms in, um, in getting information de-indexed uh, versus, on the other hand, uh, the economic freedoms of the search engine of Google and uh, the information freedoms of its users. And as this case also illustrates, the battleground on which this, um, on which this balancing operation took place was the data protection framework. At the time, it was still the directive, but uh, the same uh, would apply to the GDPR, which is now uh, the framework which is in force, obviously. So put very briefly, uh, the GDPR as a whole is a manifestation of this Article 52.1 in the Charter, in that it lays down an infrastructure for fair balancing. And so it's so important to stress that the GDPR should not be equated to this right to data protection uh, in the Charter. And this is a common mistake uh, that uh, GDPR would just be an operationalization of this one and only uh, right to data protection in the Charter. Uh, instead, it is a legal framework that protects all of these fundamental rights and freedoms whenever they are affected by data processing. And this is also stressed in Article 1 of the GDPR. And so the GDPR can also be used to safeguard an individual's uh, freedom of expression, for example, when challenging automated uh, content dig takedowns, or to safeguard non-discrimination in a whole range of automated decision-making processes that I certainly don't have to tell to this audience. But so this is taking me uh, uh, too far ahead already. What I want to say is that, as you can see, uh, um, in Article 52, Paragraph 1, 
is that any limitation on a fundamental right, and so also the right to data protection, needs to respect the essence still of that respective fundamental right. Uh, leading back to the whole discussion of what exactly is this essence of a right. Also, a lot has been written on, on that uh, recently. So this, I will jump uh, over this slide. It's also available uh, online. Uh, if you want to have a closer look, it was just to illustrate that there's different perspectives on uh, what this essence entails of the right to data protection in particular. And also in the paper uh, with Damien, uh, which is referenced uh, online, you can read more about uh, what we think about that as well. In any case, in that paper, uh, we defend, as I said before, that data protection at its very core is about safeguarding a minimum level of control over uh, one's personal data. And it's important that here control should be interpreted broadly and not simply as an individual's control over their personal data directly, but as a robust architecture of control that actively pursues individual autonomy. And so, the GDPR, even if it is there to safeguard any and all fundamental rights and freedoms, the right, it, it does safeguard the right to data protection in particular. And it does so in a, uh, by, giving, by safeguarding uh, control, uh, this architecture of control, both positively and negatively, uh, by giving the tools to data subjects to actually directly control what happens with their data. And clear examples would be the consent mechanism, uh, or data subject rights, and right to erasure, right to object, and so on. But also in, an, uh, uh, in a protective way by installing mechanisms to safeguard our autonomy and individual self-determination from being subverted by data processing operations. So this was a very brief primer uh, on the interaction of the right to data protection in the Charter with the GDPR, which is what we call in, uh, in the EU a secondary piece of legislation. So now let's look at the GDPR in particular. So the, there's many different ways through which fairness is manifested within this framework, both explicitly and implicitly. So first of all, explicitly as as a first data protection principle in Article 5.1a, uh, where it is clearly linked with the lawfulness and transparency principles. Uh, so this requirement that, uh, that data should be collected on the basis of a lawful ground only, and uh, the requirement to disclose a range of information in order to uh, ensure uh, fair processing. Uh, so. Um, this is just an overview of the different key data protection principles, which you can find in Article 5.1. And as you can see, fairness features uh, in, uh, as the first one, together with lawfulness and transparency. But it also features implicitly throughout the framework as, inherent balancing, as an inherent balancing act, which is embedded throughout the entire uh, framework. And this idea of countering power asymmetries regarding the control over data processing. And so, an example would be the need that if you rely on consent as a lawful ground, this needs to be freely given. And in particularly asymmetric relationships, the data controller, the entity that is responsible for processing, should install safeguards that uh, that consent is indeed freely given. The GDPR also puts a lot more emphasis on controller responsabilization in the form of these new obligations of data protection by design and by default in Article 25, uh, but also data protection impact assessments and so on. But so this distinction between uh, implicit and explicit uh, fairness might not be entirely satisfactory uh, because fairness involves much more than just the need to inform individuals. I don't have to tell this audience that transparency uh, in isolation will hardly ever lead to uh, a fair outcome per se. And uh, fairness also involves much more than just the initial phase of data collection. Um, So, the fairness principle, 
as uh, Lars also alluded to, is relevant throughout the entire uh, data protection life cycle. At the moment of data, con uh, data collection, each controller needs a lawful ground for processing. And so Article 6.1 gives an exhaustive list of, of six, uh, six situations that might render lawful the collection and future processing of data. And these, these are just consent, uh, data should be, or uh, data should be necessary for the performance of a contract, it's necessary to comply with the legal obligation to uh, uh, protect the vital interest of the uh, data subject, necessary for a performance uh, for, to, in the public, uh, necessary for the performance of a task carried out in the public interest, or a sort of catch-all lawful grant. Uh, data can also be processed when uh, um, necessary for the legitimate interests of the data controller, as long as these are not overridden by the rights and freedoms of the data subject. So it's important to stress that uh, these grants do not just relate to the specific moment that the data processing, that the data processing operations start. They need to be maintained throughout the entire process. And this is perhaps most clearly illustrated by the last lawful grant, this, this balancing act uh, that needs to be maintained throughout the processing uh, uh, the life cycle. What may be a fair balance initially might not be later on. And this also brings me to the importance of data subject rights, you know, that the GDPR also uh, puts, puts much more in the spotlight as compared to the earlier regime. And so these uh, are there to actively enable uh, or empower individuals to better understand processing operations and uh, to challenge them if needed. And this is especially relevant these days in light of the, the inertia among many data protection authorities. And so these data subject rights that you see in the bottom here are uh, actually a vehicle for the fairness principle in that they, for, that they force the need to particularize balancing acts to individual situations. And so the initial balancing act, uh, for example, to ensure that consent is indeed free, or that these legitimate interests of the controller are not overridden. Uh, these, this, this, this initial balancing act will generally be done unilaterally by the data controller on the basis of the average data subject. So this will not account for the specific situation of certain individuals. And so these data subject rights, they empower those individuals to, to make controllers reconsider their initial balancing act, uh, but then taking into account the specific circumstances of the respective data subject, uh, which may uh, be more or less affected by the respective uh, processing operations. And with that, I give the floor to Damien. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, so I think on the basis of that, we can see uh, the data protection framework as the system of fairness checks and balances, both ex ante and ex post. Um, but I think, you know, so far um, you might be sitting there, God, they're really not answering the question that was uh, posed in the title of the presentation in what is fairness and data protection. Um, and that is because I suppose it should be clear that it, it's a very hard concept to define. It's very malleable. Um, it's a fairly nebulous concept. Um, and just very briefly before I move on to the case study, I'd like to position um, you know, this notion of fairness within um, the debates around AI ethics. So what have, what have people actually uh, said about this? So <clears throat> uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor um, was, I, I suppose, one of the first institute, or first people, I suppose, to uh, speak about this move uh, towards uh, digital ethics. Um, but when I first uh, read this statement, um, I found it um, a little bit difficult to, to conceptualize because if we have fairness as this very open concept, um, what does positioning it as a legal principle versus ethics actually mean? Um, you know, if it is this very uh, open concept uh, in terms of its scope and application, um, what, how does it, this relate, I suppose, to the movement towards AI ethics? Um, and this is also offset or positioned next to the fact that even within this AI ethics literature, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the ethical term actually amounts to. Um, so we have uh, uh, another statement here by uh, Hilke Heymans and, Ra and Charles Rabb uh, kind of positioning that. Um, 
Now, there has been a lot of criticism of these AI ethics uh, discussions. I'm sure many of you are aware of them. Um, now, Paul Nemitz offers the GDPR as an example of AI regulation, um, and it does seem reasonable to conclude uh, similarly to him, yeah, that uh, the legal requirements expressed in the GDPR should be delineated from the broader ethical concerns, which remain unexpressed or ambiguous in terms of obligations and safeguard laid down in an abstract sense. However, at the same time, the GDPR can be seen as a manifestation of ethical things, yeah, so ethical considerations. So there is still, there is a delineation, and uh, on this basis, for instance, you could refer to Fleury's distinction between hard and soft ethics, with hard ethics being manifested in the, in the regulatory framework, and the soft then being kind of the decisions that are actually not manifest in the framework, but may actually uh, reveal themselves in the context of a specific uh, fair balancing situation uh, where personal data is actually being processed. So on that basis, I think um, you could position, it, um, position this AI ethics debate um, within two takeaways there. So that the GDPR is a regulatory manifestation of ethical concerns. And then on the other hand, that the gray areas that are left within the GDPR, um, that fairness is a potential avenue for these uh, ethical or soft ethical debates, uh, to use Floridi's uh, language. Uh, and through such an understanding, uh, of the fairness principle, it would, be obliged, uh, would oblige the adoption of ethical data practices and standardization mechanisms which effectively incorporate broader socio-ethical uh, based considerations in their operation. Now, this might be a little bit of a fanciful uh, conclusion or, you know, I'm, uh, because realistically uh, all of these balancing exercises are left in the hands of controllers, so commercial entities. Um, so, uh, you know, although it is a potential avenue, uh, fairness is a potential avenue for these ethical considerations, it may also be a potential avenue for these more business ethical uh, debates, yeah? Okay. So, I think on the basis that we're just going to maybe move on to the case study because uh, we're rapidly running out of time and I think it's more important that we make this a little bit more interactive. Um, so the, the conclusion for it is basically that fairness in data protection uh, is a vehicle for AI ethics, at least to a certain degree. Um, and on that basis now, I'd just like maybe you to kind of uh, take out the case study that would be on the microsite um, and have a read through of it. Uh, once you've read it, if you could have a discussion and then we're going to come together. Um, we have prepared a few questions to try and stimulate discussion, or at least we hope it will. Um, and uh, we'll see where it gets us. Okay, so if you could read it and then have a chat, it would be good. <laughs> it's on the microsite, yeah. So if you go for this, for this particular session, uh, you'll find the case study. Ah, um, I think it's event 2020 and capital E. Event with a capital E, yeah. Yeah, and we'll give you about 10 minutes to just read through. The internet is down. The internet is down. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's quite long, but um, will I just bring it up? Ah, okay. So you should find it there, yeah? So in the microsite. 
Okay, I mean, to make this easier, I'll just explain it briefly. I mean, have people found it or are you still looking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> a lot of text is law, I think. Okay, so just in the interest of time, I'm going to briefly explain it, um, and then we'll, we'll get on to a series of, the series of questions, yeah? So the hypothetical speaks about, uh, so an imaginary company, as you might imagine, called uh, IO um, Everything, who has two products that they wish to launch. So one is a virtual assistant, and the other one is a smart fridge. Um, so the first question, and it's actually explicitly stated within the, um, in the hypothetical that it does come within the, the, the scope of application of the GDPR, but I mean, as a lawyer, that would be the first question that you'd actually ask. So I thought that we would pose the question and then we just try to give you um, a brief analysis as to why it does actually fit within the scope. So when you're looking at that, you're looking at whether uh, there's the processing of personal data. Yeah? Um, so when we're looking at these notions, we're looking at Article 4.2 of the GDPR for the definition of processing and Article 4.1 for the definition of personal data. Processing is an extremely broad uh, notion. So that is not going to be any kind of a hurdle to the application of the GDPR. So then it's just simply a question of whether personal data are processed themselves. There are four elements here to consider. So it's a question of whether there's information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Now, information, again, is extremely broad. It can be pretty much anything. Uh, relating to, uh, the Court of Justice in this case law has looked at three elements for this. It can either relate to someone in its content, in the purpose, or the effect. Uh, uh, again, so very broad. Yeah? Uh, with the identified, uh, what's important here is or identifiable. Again, extremely broad. Yeah? Because uh, it isn't only... Um, data that can be held by what would be known as the controller, but also third parties which may result in the identification of someone or rendering someone identifiable. And the last bit is the natural person who is the data subject. Now, 
just as a, a, a very sharp primer, um, we have the data subject, we have the controller and the processor. The processor is the, uh, the controller rather is the one who defines the purpose and means. Uh, the processor then uh, acts on behalf of the controller. So they're the three entities we're talking about and we can see it, uh, these two applications or devices would clearly fit within the definition of personal data because it is extremely broad uh, and there would be processing of personal data. So that's the, the preliminary consideration when we're looking at this. In addition to that then, and in the hypothetical, it's explained that the imaginary company is extremely worried about uh, the potential effects of the application of the GDPR. Um, and a lot of the discussion, uh, what, the way it's framed, is that the potential challenges of applying consent uh, since the reform of the old directive and the uh, entry into force of the regulation. Um, so there are different uh, conditions for lawful processing that Jeff mentioned. In a commercial data processing context, you're, look, you're actually looking at consent, contract, and the last one, legitimate interest, so the broad catch-all balancing grounds that Jeff presented as well. So with the modifications to consent, a lot of companies have been left scrambling, trying to figure out, well, can we put it into one of the others? Yeah? Can we legitimize our day-to-day -day operations within one of the other grounds for data processing? Which inherently brings up questions of fairness and the balance that's been struck by those companies and the information that should be provided, uh, et cetera, to uh, data subjects. And I thought just to position this a little bit, we'll look at what is one of the key additions or modifications that was brought in by the GDPR. And that's uh, the further specification of the elements that is in uh, the definition of consent. So that's provided in Article 7 of the GDPR. Um, now we're going to come back to that in a bit and it's kind of going to be one of our reference points. Um, but one of the key points to push here, just so we have it in our minds, is the question of what is freely given consent. Uh, because there are question marks as to whether you can actually hold access to a service hostage for uh, the consent of the individual. So you have to consent in order to see the content, you have to consent in order to um, access the service or whatever, yeah? So consent to data processing in a very broad sense. Uh, whereas this provision seems to suggest that uh, in order for consent to be freely given, you shouldn't be able to make such um, unilateral uh, requests. So the first question that we have really is, you know, can these two devices be placed in the same bracket? So uh, is there any points of delineation that you might imagine between this kind of virtual assistant sitting in some sort of a box in a smart home versus a smart fridge? So, you know, um, we just want to get you thinking about any potential challenges that you might see in the operation of, uh, you know, very practically, yeah? So we have a very broad notion of personal data, we have a very broad notion of processing, um, but these specific applications bring their own challenges. So, you know, anyone who wants to volunteer any information, uh, feel free. Yeah. Yeah. The fridge seems more like an ad interface, at least in part of its function. So that would be whether the end user wanted to see it or not, they would receive those dietary recommendations. So it seemed like enough of a differentiator to me. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, it seems that in the smart fridge application, there, there's an active role for a developer developing an algorithm to transform the data into a recommendation or prediction that doesn't necessarily seem to be present in the first. Okay. So issues of com maybe competition there as well, yeah. I think the, the nature of a fridge is that you can put things in and take things out. There are more active engagements that you constantly have, whereas in a voice assistant situation, the, the ambient nature and also the covert nature, it's very hard to covertly be surprised by a fridge and put something in there without having realized you've done that. I mean, maybe if you go you know, walking at night, but yeah, so that's, that's more opportunity for interfacing. Yeah. Um, so two things with the with the smart home assistant. I think it's much more likely that data from um, identifiable natural persons from outside a household 
um, is processed because they might have visitors and they might drop the name or they might be identifiable by other um, information, while the fridge, access to the fridge would be restricted mainly to the household members and also um, you would not necessarily be able to attribute the consumption to other people. Yeah. Um, secondly, the fridge might have, as is stated in the case study, more or less um, connections to um, special categories of personal data, such as health data. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, yeah, they're, they're good points. And I think, like, the purpose of that question is to show the context-dependent nature of what might be fair in a specific context. I mean, practically speaking, yeah, you're right in terms of, you know, visitors to the household. And if we think about, like, the conditions for lawful processing that we might have there, I mean, how, if we were to rely on consent, for example, how do we get a visitor to the household to consent? Um, so it's a very stupid but a very practical uh, difficulty in the application or uh, potential compliance of these systems in the household. I would build on the earlier comment from the person sitting a few rows behind me in that one of the ways in which they are differentiated is that the fridge is actually maintaining information, it's surveilling essentially your health in a way that could also be particularly harmful to disabled people. And, and although I've heard other people comment that the voice assistant might be surveilling by accident anyone who's a guest, the fridge might too. Guests put things in the fridge. I put my shit in other people's fridges all the time, which A, could defeat the purpose of the software, even if the person whose home it was was comfortable with that level of surveillance of their food habits, but B, is also disturbing to every guest. And I would say ultimately though that even though they're not the same piece of technology, because they're interlinked by the IO Everything proposal here, they are essentially both incredibly privacy violating surveilling technologies that would scare the shit out of me if they were in my house and I don't want them there. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I think like the, the thing I suppose to point out is that there could be sensitivities with both in terms of the types of data that might um, be extracted from it or inferred, yeah? So it's not just the AI systems that might reveal sensitivities, um, but also the smart fridge in terms of uh, the health data. So this was already mentioned um, so any risk for either processing sensitive personal data as prohibited in Article 9.1. So I'm just going to show you what Article 9.1 uh, contains because, you know, it, <laughs> I, for me it raises uh, real questions about the legality of any of these similar technologies that are currently on the market. So you have processing of personal data revealing racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, etc., etc., but you can have you know, the processing of genetic data, biometric data for the purpose of uniquely identifying a person, data concerning health. So there is a specific prohibition on the processing of these types of information within the regulation. So, you know, with the smart fridge, you can certainly have health-related data. Uh, it depends on the question. It really depends on what is meant by processing of data revealing. Yeah? Um, Within the uh, virtual assistant, you could definitely have biometric data, yeah? Or even because it is listening in the background, it could reveal things about someone's sex life or whatever. So there are clear question marks about how these specific applications would fit within this general prohibition. So if we deep dive down, I think, a little bit more, um, into the virtual assistant then. So we have uh, this primer as a question. So what potential challenges does this raise for the smart assistant in terms of the conditions for lawful processing, keeping in mind that in the home people may often have conversations on sensitive topics. So just as a specific example. So what does this prohibition actually mean in effect? Yeah? So how does it actually challenge this? So practically speaking, uh, for commercial data processing contexts, you could probably, you could rely on the explicit consent of the data subject or uh, uh, when it's manifestly made sub, uh, uh, public by the data subject. This manifestly made public by the data subject is an extremely difficult exception to figure out what it actually means. But practically speaking, uh, it is the explicit consent of the data subject that would be required. Now this is an extremely high burden to reach, this explicit consent, because this is even more than the, con the consent that we presented earlier. So it presents real practical challenges. So if 
these devices are shown to be processing or revealing these processing personal data revealing these sensitive attributes, it places a huge burden, practically speaking, on whether they're legal or not. A compliance, it's a major compliance risk. So I think with the data subject rights, I'll leave Jeff speak about them, but I mean, we presented some of them, like right to object, etc. So there's also real practical concerns there in terms of the balance that was struck by the legislator and the fairness, the operation of the fairness principle practically within these. So I know this is a bit like doomsday, I suppose, with the, the, you know, the risks and uh, compliance um, questions, but yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Right, so again, for time, uh, we're just going to look at right of access and right to object, which we think are most interesting perhaps in this, in this specific case and within a confined uh, uh, time. Uh, but so before, I'll, I'll just give a brief uh, explanation of these rights and then we can go into the actual uh, question. And so before, before looking at actual right of access and right to object in particular, it's important to also um, look at Article 12 of the GDPR, because uh, the European legislator now try to put down clear modalities for exercising uh, data subject rights. And so we have an overview here. Contrary to before, uh, you need to be able to exercise those rights free of charge. Um, there's a clear time limit. Uh, the controller, the data controller, has in principle uh, up to one month to respond. Uh, both the form of exercising as well of uh, responding to an, uh, a data subject right uh, are subject to, to some requirements, uh, such as they, they should be uh, proportionate to whatever uh, your, the relationship is with the data subject. And if, the, if it's, for example, in the context of an electronic service, those rights should be easily exercisable uh, electronically as well. Uh, in some empirical research I've done myself uh, a couple of years ago, um, several big online uh, players requested uh, an access request to be done via email, uh, via, uh, via uh, snail mail, and also responded uh, uh, via uh, um, uh, actual postal mail. Um, then, um, Again, this is again a, a manifestation of, of the fairness principle, if you will. Uh, the, the information and interaction with, um, with data subjects should be done in an intelligible form, which should also consider the particularities of that individual, of that data subject. And so specifically in the context when a large proportion of your user base are, for example, children, um, this is a very important um, thing to keep in mind, of course. And then there's also the issue of verification of identity. Of course, you don't, especially with regard to the right of access, you do not want to um, um, share personal data with someone else. Uh, there is currently a lot of um, uh, research on how exactly to go about this. In, in practice, we often see that controllers seem to completely and entirely block uh, data subject rights unless the data subject um, sends uh, a full copy of their passport, et cetera, et cetera, which is in many cases quite problematic. Uh, but so um, um, this is yeah, also something that uh, might require more time to, to dig into uh, in more detail. Um, anyway, so looking at transparency of the right of access. Um, so basically transparency is very much connected, as I said before, with the fairness principle. It has two sort of dimensions. The, the core, the epicenter, if you will, of uh, transparency in the GDPR is uh, in Article 13 to 15. These first two provisions require, give a whole list of information that needs to be provided at the very latest when the processing operation starts, and so typically through privacy policies. And Article 15 is sort of the ex post transparency mechanism, um, which gives individuals the right to ask for uh, their specific personal data and more information about their particular uh, situation. And so transparency has been central to data protection law from the very start uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, guarantees accountability, responsibility, uh, and compliance, but it also enables 
data, other data subject rights. And it's, it will be hard to exercise uh, right to data portability of right to object, right to erasure if you don't exactly know which or what personal data uh, is held by the controller. And it's also, it also guarantees other legal rights. Increasingly, we see this right of access used in, in labor cases, uh, in, in um, migration cases, and so on. As you can see, Article 15 uh, <laughs> provides a long list of information that a data subject can request. And, and importantly, it goes much further than just a copy of the actual data the controller has on you. Also the purpose, uh, where the data came from, uh, and who it has been shared with, uh, the retention period, and so on and so on. So again, in um, the specific uh, case study in front of us now, we could ask, we could wonder like, what um, would, would I just told you, how far this right of access would reach and what potential challenges a right of access uh, might encounter. So is, does anybody want to give this a go? I see several people in the audience that have definitely experienced with the right of access. So, <laughs> and they're raising, they're putting their hands in the air. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Michael. There's a microphone. It's, yeah, it's very difficult to know who and how to make the request. It's a physical device. It's not always clear uh, if you ask a question physically to the virtual assistant. It doesn't really understand it. Uh, where do you go to send an email and the like? Um, and also receiving that in, in the second part of the problem, one of them, is that receiving the data, uh, all of the audio recordings on the device can be you know, quite an unwieldy set of files uh, to, to access when they, when they are sent and if they are sent. And there are various compliance reasons why they're not. But also, when you think of uh, the data that both of these devices collect, a lot of it is telemetry data, a lot of it is, is what was placed in the fridge when in, out, open the door, close the door, and that's very hard for a data subject to understand because it's really designed for the machine to pass, um, and it's not visualized or seen in a way that is useful, um, and it reads like a log, um, but that's obviously, it's more sensitive than a log in many ways and, and can be used in more sensitive ways than it would appear. Yes, indeed. So that's an issue that is often uh, encountered indeed when even if controllers are already quite um, um, complete in uh, accommodating a right of access and actually provide uh, quite a substantial data set, for the average data subject, it will often be quite uh, difficult to understand. And then there's a lot of debate currently and as to how far the obligation on the controller's shoulder uh, to make that intelligible, that information intelligible to uh, data subjects. I'm not quite sure whether this is the same that Michael and you just said <laughs> or not. Um, in principle, it's clear what data the box has or the, the uh, control of the box has. Everything that's been said in my home since day one, right? Um, that's not interesting. I know that. And if I had uh, unlimited memory, I would know what I've said. What's interesting, what's scary is what they made of it. And Sorry. what they made of it, what they, what they inferred from it. And they're not going to tell me that. And so that really limits my right in any meaningful way. I think I'm not making sense, Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I this mean, is exactly also some of the um, challenges people currently face in trying to test this right of access to, as to the, the, the scope indeed. Like um, most people, at least data protection lawyers that would read the GDPR would say that those inferences also fall within the scope. Uh, they're also personal data, right? In practice, often uh, many companies offer these data download tools. Um, to some extent, they might include a limited amount of, of inferred data, but, but, uh, but this is uh, often still very much lacking. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also the point I was trying to make about the sensitive data category, yeah? Because, I mean, if you speak about that, then it's the inferences which reveal sensitivities, which, I mean, which raises the massive compliance risk. Because if it's sensitive personal data, there's a prohibition 
So it, it is the interesting thing, and it's the thing that could actually delegitimize a lot of these applications. Is it even clear who the data subject is for a lot of the data, especially in the fridge where you don't know who's eating what, you just know whether it's in or out in the fridge? Um, how could a company even match a piece of data to a specific person correctly? Do you want me to take yeah. it? No, exactly, yeah. It's, I mean, <laughs> and then with the voice, with the virtual assistant, it's the same thing, right? To what extent can, if I knew like in, in a certain date and time I was uh, visiting uh, Damien, can I then file an access request with, you know, whatever uh, voice assist, virtual assistant of your choice you have in your house? The thing as well is that it would still be personal data because the scope is so broad, so it's identifiable, but that is such a broad notion that it still falls within. So yeah, you still get the practical challenges. Yes, so my, my question is very much related to this. I think it is a real question, who is the data subject, and but then also who can exercise the right in the name of the data subject, especially if you have a fridge and then you have children, and then children, are they supposed to access their own data? If they do, can they be told, no, this is the data of your mother, therefore it's a third party, we are not showing this to you? Or, and, and the, also the other way around, if the mother is requesting the data, can they say, oh, no, the data of the children, we are not showing this to you? I think there are many questions that we don't have an answer for this because we cannot forget that there are many data subjects with different special relations. That it's not just when you visit each other, which is easier to figure out. Yeah, just something on the smart fridge. Uh, I mean, in the example, the smart fridge explicitly profile users, but uh, the data controller might easily play with that and hide the profile building mechanism because it's not uh, any significant decision, etc. cetera. Oh, I mean, arguably. And so this is another thing that the user would like, I mean, Perhaps the user would be interested in understanding how the profile works, mm -hmm. and they could not uh, understand it because um, because the article 13 and 14 are quite limited on that. So, but this is not a compliance issue. This is more a policy issue, I guess. But I think we can probably. Yeah, there's someone I think else. There's two more questions, and then we'll sorry. go to the next one. Hi, sorry. I want to add like. Probably many data could also relate to different, uh, it could not just relate to different people, it probably relates to different people. And then the question is, um, if one person gets access to it, then what happens with the data access rights of that other person if they prov want to prevent that the data is actually accessed? So, for example, if you live in a student house, then probably you have a fridge with a lot of food and then um, you own certain food, but then someone else steals it from the fridge and you want to know who stole it from the fridge. Well, the, the person who stole it from the fridge probably doesn't want you to know. So then who controls the data about that specific event? <laughs> Um, and one quick thing as well that I, I also, also in relation to profiling, uh, when you've trained a machine learning model, you can deploy it either locally or in the cloud, and you don't have to store the results of the, the profile. If the profile is involved in some dynamic decision system, then the data in the fridge is transmitted either to the cloud or, or to a model that's on the device, executed, the result of the profile comes back, an action in the fridge is taken or an action in the virtual assistant is taken, um, then the, uh, that profile is then deleted and redacted and starts ab initio next time um, because the, the device might not need to restore, record it and therefore a right of access doesn't help you very much because the, the processor, the controller is deleting the data as they go that could be seen as invasive. Exactly, and this is indeed um, sort of a way in which um, controllers can also you know, um, ensure a fair balance in a way by installing strong data protection by design uh, mechanisms in order to minimize the amount of personal data that is actually stored. Um, in light of time, I'm going to quickly jump to the next right. Is there still time? Yeah, so the right to object. Um, in uh, the GDPR, um, which basically gives individuals, data subjects, uh, the rights to um, 
ask specific processing operations to be stopped. Uh, um, as I said before, a controller will often have this balance made on the basis of the, 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 the average data subject. Right to object gives the ability to individuals, to data subjects, to challenge uh, those uh, processing operations uh, on the basis of their particular situation. And, and the controller can only ignore this right to object when uh, it has compelling legitimate grounds to that override the interests, rights, or freedoms of the data subject. Um, in light of time, I'm going to skip this. <laughs> or maybe I'll just quickly explain. Right of access, uh, right, right to object, right to erasure are often um, confused with one another. Uh, the main difference between the two is actually the scope of application. Uh, is the scope of what it entails, rather. Um, right to object is very specific, very surgical. It looks at specific processing operations, whereas right to erasure uh, looks at uh, or targets the actual personal data. And so practically what this means, if you look at Facebook's privacy policy, for example, uh, it lists a whole range of processing purposes that it uses the same personal data for, a right to object would enable the data subject to target any uh, of these specific processing purposes uh, in isolation. Uh, because the balancing act, the fair balancing act, might differ depending on what specific processing operation you're talking about. You know, processing data for marketing purposes will uh, have a different uh, balance than processing it for security reasons. Right to erasure will be much more stricter from at least a data subject's perspective because the effect will be that the personal data cannot be used for any of those purposes anymore. So, um, yeah, do you want to take it over from here? Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I thought now um, we just go through, uh, you know, the two other uh, ancillary purposes that were mentioned then in the hypothetical. So that, that there uh, the company is thinking of adding these two as non-optional features within uh, the, the device. So that there's advertising and there's also insurance, yeah? So how would that actually fit within the, the legislative balance that was struck by the legislator? So how would it actually play out? Um, so um, I had mentioned earlier that there's uh, different conditions for lawful processing. Um, and uh, so consent, contract, and legitimate interests. Um, realistically speaking, uh, with uh, this type of application, a lot of discussion, there's been a lot of discussion again, as I mentioned, around consent and what the freely given stipulation means. So if you're adding something like this as a non-optional feature, uh, which might be very appealing from a commercial perspective because you know, uh, you guarantee that the, that the information can be shared for these other purposes. Um, how, does it, uh, how does it actually fit within it? Yeah? So in particular, we're looking at Article 7.4, uh, which, which says that uh, when determining whether consent is freely given, utmost account uh, should be taken with, of whether inter alia, the performance of contract, including the provision of service, is conditional on consent. So in assessing whether consent is actually freely given, uh, it is looking at this take it or leave it situation to see if this condition is actually fulfilled or not. So that's quite significant. In the recitals then, there's even uh, further spec specification of this. Recitals are non-binding, it should be said, but they are very persuasive. So. Uh, the highlighted bits there, so um, especially the second half of it, so consent is presumed not to be freely given if it does not allow uh, separate consent to be given in different personal data processing operations despite it being appropriate in the individual uh, case. So relying on consent in this specific situation doesn't seem to fly. Yeah? So you can't just say, well, here's our device. We're going to do all these things. If you don't consent, well, tough. Don't buy the device. Uh, so that presents a bit of a, you know, a problem or a stumbling block within the context of the hypothetical. However, even if you're then relying on, uh, for instance, the legitimate interest ground, so you have it here, the 61F that uh, Jeff presented as this overarching uh, catch-all uh, one that involves the fair balancing of rights and interests. So if you say as uh, a controller that you're going to base these 
um, uh, marketing and, uh, for instance, the health insurance uh, example on this. Uh, it also has potentially problematic application when you refer to the right to object that Jeff just presented. Because for, um, for in this specific grounds, it's noted that, um, it's just here, so when it's used for marketing, direct marketing purposes, if the data subject does object, then they must stop this processing operation. So again, from a very practical perspective, you run into these uh, clear challenges with trying to legitimize such behavior practically in the operation of uh, the regulations provisions. Now, there is a problem with all this. I think um, we're presenting a very kind of rosy view of the GDPR uh, as a piece of regulation, um, at least from depending on what side of the um, uh, argument you're sitting on, but, um, or you're standing on. But, I mean, there are challenges in the operation of the GDPR, and there are challenges uh, which manifest themselves in the discussion around fairness as well, because, I mean, what is it exactly? And there's also the challenges, practically speaking, because all of this is being conducted by the controller, and the controller is the one who has the invested interests here. Yeah? There is um, really a lot of difficulty in applying the accountability principles. So how do you responsibilize the controller to actually do these things correctly? Um, on top of that, it's a risk-based regulation. So the increasing risk, the more likelihood, likelihood that you have to rely on consent versus a balancing ground like legitimate interests. Um, so there is a lot of uncertainty here. Uh, for example, as was mentioned extensively when we were going uh, through the the, one of the examples, uh, for, it might be very difficult to figure out who the data subject is. Um, and I mean that practically, but also in a normative sense within the law. So is it an average data subject test or not? We don't have an indication of who this entity, who this person, you, me, everyone in this room actually is. So that pr presents real challenges in the practical application of uh, the framework. Now, another important thing to mention is the fact that realistically, there should be impact assessments on all this, uh, a data protection impact assessment. But uh, I suppose this very much relates to the concerns I've just presented. Um, you, you know, realistically, there might be no way of reviewing whether first this actually happened or second, how it was actually conducted. Um, and you have all the challenges again with accountability, responsibility for the actions that are being uh, taken and how this fair balance might be struck. So how fairness manifests itself practically. Now, um, I, I'm kind of conscious of uh, opening it up to more questions if people have like specific concerns about uh, any of the, the things or uh, things they want to say. Um, the last uh, section of slides that, uh, I, that you'll have online are uh, about the interlapping between data protection and consumer protection. Um, because the argument is, I suppose, because there's such a degree of uncertainty within the data protection uh, notions of fairness, can you look at, for instance, consumer protection as a distinct policy agenda, as a means of elaborating on when specific uh, processing operations or applications and purposes might be deemed unfair in that consumer policy debate? But before I do a discussion of that, does anyone have any particular concerns about uh, what has just been said, or any additional questions or points to be raised? Uh, if I summarize what I've heard in the last uh, umpteen minutes, these things are manifestly illegal. Um, so why do they exist? Uh, is there a major legal challenge going on? Well, I think uh, I know that there's been um, like different data subject access requests for various information that's been held by a uh, virtual assistant. I know Michael's been involved with some of that. Um, with Alexa, I think, yeah, um, or Siri. Um, um, so, like, I, I think there are actions ongoing. Um, it kind of relates a lot to the accountability principle that the hand is in, it is in the hands of the controller. And what we're lacking then is the enforcement stick. So, um, you know, there needs a bit of a carrot stick approach to this. And at the moment, there, we're kind of lacking uh, a big enough stick to make sure that the practices are actually monitored. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
I can't tell you why they're currently allowed to do this. Uh, I think it's more of a regulatory enforcement question. Um, so it's more asking data protection authorities why there aren't cases being taken. So that's a bit of an unsatisfying answer, I think. But. A link to that. Um, if I offer a free service, isn't it in my legitimate interest per se that I monetize people's data? Um, that would definitely be an argument that's made by the industry. Um, when assessing what legitimate interests actually mean and the notion of necessity within that, the court has interpreted it very narrowly uh, because you are talking about, you know, people's personal data, which filters in through the charter. So um, the argument is that essentially that the balance is, um, should be struck in the favour of the data subject, that you would need consent for those types of operations. Um, now, uh, that's kind of an issue that goes to the very core of the economic architecture of the internet, really, at the moment. Um, and we, can, we could look at the actions being taken against, um, you know, the RTB system, uh, online behavioural advertising, as very much linked to that issue as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing as to what decision is going to be made at the regulatory enforcement level. But at the moment, there's, yeah, it's difficult for Jeff. Yeah, indeed, as you say, they might well have a commercial interest, but that's just one side of the balance, obviously, right? And the other I, side of the balance, yeah. there's other interests, and indeed, as Damien said, the Court of Justice has generally accorded quite limited weight to this commercial interest, especially at, if at the other side there's fundamental rights and freedoms at stake. Uh, just to say that I completely agree with that, right? No. I, I'm, I'm just surprised. I mean, you, you are so careful and nice and step by step here, but the bottom line is none of this is okay in any meaningful sense. And, and that, that really worries me why there's not a loud and resounding conclusion on a lot of fronts. Like, I'm sorry, this is not about whether there's an extra info box that gives someone some, something to click on in order to exercise uh, right 23B, um, but a really resounding like, no. We cannot have that, and if we allow that, the inroads for that, because so many people like these services, uh, we can just uh, put data protection into the trash can. And please give your opinions on that. <laughs> if I want, can address that first point as well. I think that it, there's also a, a more important role laid ahead of us to kind of make the translation effort on why we find these values uh, enveloped within data protection so important and translated to the public so that people do not, I mean, it, we might come to the conclusion that these services are illegal, but they are widely used and their popularity is not really waning. So there we can perhaps translate to the public why we find it so important and why perhaps they shouldn't use it. And when it comes to uh, an anecdote that kind of relates to the uh, data subject rights, at one of our presentations that we gave in Belgium, one of the participants in the audience said, well, when I get a subject access request, I know it's one of you researchers, another, another, real, another real person. So they know when we get something, we know it's for research, so perhaps then we shouldn't, well, I, I, I won't put it as a, a nefarious comment per se, but it kind of also indicates what perhaps the mindset might be if a company gets these access requests at the moment, like it's more research, not really the public at large that lies awake of these problems at the moment. Um, I have a question about the free consent. If, if you have a premium and a free option where the free requires uh, advertising or something, mm -hmm. um, does that co count as free consent or not? It, it, that's an open question. Um, I, I like. <laughs> There are a lot of kind of um, intellectual debates there as to whether you're putting a price on privacy and all that kind of thing, but um, at the moment there's no clear answer. Um, and actually it does relate to the, the consumer protection policy stuff that I was going to show because, you know, this question and the, the difference of opinion, potentially the widespread use of these versus, you know, the clear challenges in terms of whether they're compliant or not um, is also reflected in policy developments on that side, but we'll see if we have time, but please go yeah. ahead. Uh, one of the issues with the IoT devices is that people purchase them, or sometimes they get them as gifts, so you're actually making the choice to bring them into your home. 
plug them in, hook them up to your Wi-Fi. In other words, it's much less, it's harder to argue that we don't actually know what's going on with these objects than things like, I mean, recently there was Clearview AI that's been scraping websites and we see that the, it's the same people that are on the boards of Facebook and Clear, Clearview AI. So you know that even if they're engaging in illegal practices, the social media, the GAFAs won't necessarily go after them. So the question is, can we opt out of the, those kinds of surveillance systems? I mean, to a certain extent, if I brought the IoT into my house and plugged it in, I Personally, I actually know I'm being observed and I either care or I don't, but, you know, I think, personally, I think it's getting hard to argue that we don't know what's going on. It's just we don't necessarily know the depth to which it's going to be exploited, so. Yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah, right. and, and in particular, with Clearview AI, for example, there's the, um, the GDPR, but, but if we're European and Clearview is exclusively based in the United States, can we still have uh, power and ask to be removed from their databases and things like that? Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I can take the first question, and do you want to take the second? Or, yeah. But, um, okay, in terms of um, the consent issue, um, yeah, I mean, okay, if you're, you're purchasing the device, you could say you could link in uh, the consent there and potentially argue that it might be legitimate, yeah? Um, the problem is, I suppose, um, separating the different data processing operations. So the data that might be processed to actually make the device function might then be covered by that. Uh, within the marketing and uh, health insurance thing, it's harder to argue that because of the stringent requirements for informed consent and freely given consent that are actually provided in the GDPR. Um, in addition, we have the practicalities of it, yeah? So um, we, you know, these aren't just single user devices. So uh, even though I might go and purchase it, if I have a family, it presents clear issues, or even there are people who visit my home. So I acknowledge that there's some debate around at least some of it, but there, there are also just real practical problems in terms of compliance. And I, we don't really have time to go into this, but the, the, there's also a very fluid notion of who a data controller is. Um, so, you know, the purchaser of this, uh, if you were really to extend the interpretation of, of such a device, could end up being a controller with the, all the compliance obligations that exist as well, or at least a co-controller with the company who manufactures it. So um, there are many other open issues, I suppose, with this that uh, we, we haven't had time to go into, but maybe in relation to the story. Yeah, and, a, and an added layer of complexity indeed with more and more that, especially with these virtual assistants, there's a whole range of, um, of, of third-party vendors that plug into that. And so there's increasingly also voices uh, um, claiming for sort of a, well, you could call it super responsibility or, some, or super control for the, the, the actual choke point in the middle uh, that they should have an added layer of responsibility in facilitating uh, data subject rights uh, and, and fair processing with regard to all of the other processors uh, or controllers downstream. And on your territorial uh, question, um, so basically the GDPR uh, has a very broad territorial scope which has already been uh, um, um, well, uh, criticized, especially across the Atlantic, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, first of all, it applies to, of course, uh, organizations, companies with an establishment within the EU, but also it applies to um, companies that might not have an establishment within the EU, but that are nonetheless targeting services or goods to people in the EU. Uh, and or are monitoring their behavior. And so, not just EU citizens, but anyone within the EU. Okay. Um. Yeah. All right, so, if I just recap for, for uh, for the mic, for the, for the, the video, uh, what you said was uh, that the data is collected globally, but the actual goods and services are just within the U.S., right? Uh, well, this, of course, does not matter uh, from a GDPR perspective, as long as like, a substantial amount of that data is captured also uh, within the EU. That being said, of course, the big question, again, uh, disappointingly, is enforcement, right? How are you going to enforce that? 
questions? Okay. Uh, I think in the, well, I've got three minutes to do the overlaps between consumer protection and data protection, which isn't really going to work. Um, but I, I just thought um, maybe I'll go on to one slide that shows the uncertainty, at least in one respect. Um, this one. So there are, these are just uh, screenshots of three different uh, legislative developments in the EU. So there's one uh, is the digital content directive. Uh, the second is uh, the modernization of the cons existing consumer law. Uh, and then the third one is the proposed e-privacy regulation. Now, the e-privacy regulation has dominated debates in this area. But um, I'm just going to highlight uh, all three and show you a potential contrast between them. So the e-privacy um, directive, as it currently is, provides specific rules on the use of cookies or information either placed on terminal equipment of a user uh, or access, so cookies or cookie-like technology. And it essentially states that um, f uh, for non-essential cookies, uh, you have to request the consent of the user. Um, now, that's being a massive point of contention within the reforms of, uh, the, uh, that are within the proposed e-privacy regulation. Uh, and the question is whether another lawful basis should be added, like a legitimate interest grounds. Um, so there's two camps, you know, either stick with just consent only or have some sort of a legitimate interest balancing and how you actually manifest this correctly uh, and well in a regulatory framework. So massive debates about that. As a side then to this, there's been developments in the consumer policy side, uh, which have been largely not discussed even in the data protection circles. One of them is the digital content directive, uh, which in its proposal explicitly recognized personal data as counterperformance. Um, so like an exchange uh, in a contract, yeah? So I give you access to uh, my personal data and then there's a consumer contract formed uh, and, uh, but that seems to run very much counter to um, the GDPR. So what we were trying to get out in terms of improving um, the conditions for consent, etc. cetera. Um, now, in the final version of that proposal, there's a deletion of the word counterperformance, but the recognition that the exchange of personal data results in a consumer contract is the same. So what I'm saying here is that although we've presented the GDPR as a, you know, one specific piece of legislation, we're having these debates about the legitimacy of exchange of information for access to a service across different policy agendas. And even in the EU where we have this massive regulation that's supposed to be you know, the answer to all of technology's problems, we have clear difficulties in trying to align different policy agendas. In addition to that, then the modernization directive um, I, I'm not going to go into it in much detail, but one of the interesting provisions um, from my side is that it seemingly legitimizes price um, personalization. So the provision long and short of it says that if you inform the consumer and you're transparent, you can then tran uh, personalize pricing. There seems to be uh, a level of disconnect here with the GDPR as well, because price personalization is delineated from dynamic pricing. Uh, but the processing of personal data would be required for both. So there is a real uncertainty as to how these actually work together, uh, and in addition that there might be different levels of protection. So there might be a delineation from fair data processing and unfair commercial practices or unfair terms in contracts. Um, so that we have clear policy questions in terms of the alignment of these two policy agendas. So it would reflect, I think, the concerns um, that we were speaking about earlier, but also the uncertainty um, in terms of what we want yeah, going forward. Um, so I think we're out of time now. Um, I'm sure all, all three of us would be happy to answer questions if you have them. Um, but yeah, so thanks very much for coming to the session. Thank you.